Good evening, everybody. I'm Kim Malville, and I'd like to welcome you to the, the ninth session that uh, the Retired Faculty Association has organized for our uh, distinguished professors of the university uh, to show what wonderful stuff they've been doing. As a um, fellow faculty member, retired faculty member, I think all of us are very proud of the work that our distinguished professors have been doing. And uh, we certainly are uh, just as proud and equally proud of what our speaker tonight is, is, going, to, uh, is going to talk about. Uh, professor, professor, distinguished professor Daniel Shears is in the Department of Aerospace Engineering Sciences and has been a uh, major player in, uh, in uh, exploring asteroids um, using his knowledge of, um, of inter interstellar or interplanetary navigation. If that's correct or not, we'll find out. Um, we have asked uh, Dr. Harold Levinson to introduce him. Um, Hal is a scientist at the Southwest Research Institute, which um, has two offices. One of them is in Boulder. And he has been a major player for the last 25 years in exploring the uh, origins of the solar system, has been a leader in developing models for the um, evolution and dynamic evolution of, uh, of the planets of the solar system. And, um, and that includes asteroids, minor planets, Kuiper Belt objects, um, anything you could think of involving uh, what goes around the sun. So it's uh, very, uh, very appropriate. Um, and, and in fact, it's a great honor, I think, to have, to have Hal introduce our speaker tonight. Um, and uh, I hope, um, I just want to say also that uh, he is the principal investigator of the, of the Lucy mission, which was launched on October 16th, uh, a few weeks ago. And I hope we'll be able to learn a little bit more about the Lucy mission, especially during the question and answer uh, period after um, Professor uh, Shear's uh, talk. Um, I ask everyone to make sure that you mute your speakers. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box so they can be answered at the end of um, of, um, of, of, of Dan Shear's talk. So Hal Levinson, I toss, turn the mic over to you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here actually. And I really am honored to be able to introduce Dan. Dan is uh, truly an, uh, an amazing guy. He's uh, done a lot of work in many different fields, uh, several of which he really is the dominant presence. Uh, Dan uh, earned a bachelor's of science from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, earned three degrees from a bachelor's, master's, and a PhD from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, I'm a Michigan grad too, so go blue. Uh, <laughs> as I said before, he's very diverse and he does work in many areas, including asteroid dynamics, Dynamical astronomy, astrodynamics, celestial mechanics. Uh, he's an acknowledged, and I'm only going to concentrate, and I'm only going to take a second to do this, but on the things that I actually know, he's an acknowledged expert on the dynamics of rigid bodies in orbit around one another, with um, particular emphasis on these binary asteroids and how the two objects in a binary asteroid interact with one another. Um, he's really done fundamental work in that field. He's also um, a expert on granular flows in low gravity environments, trying to understand how, what the shape of asteroids that we see are telling us about their history. Um, you know, one of the real surprising things when we started seeing asteroids up close is a lot of them are these top shape objects. I think Dan will show you some pictures of those. Uh, because Bennu is one of these things. And they came, at least to me, as a complete surprise. And Dan was one of the leaders in trying to explain 
how those shapes came to be. He's also heavily involved in deep space missions to asteroids, having roles in DART, OSIRIS-REx, uh, both the Hayabusa missions, one and two, and NEAR. And he's the principal investigator. And for those of you who don't know what that means, think of it as sort of the CEO of Janus, which is going to fly two independent small spacecraft to visit uh, two binary asteroids uh, um, systems. Um, so I'll turn it over, after that, I'll turn it up over to Dan. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Al. It's actually an honor to me <laughs> to, to have you introduce me because uh, you're, a, you're, you're a great guy and you're a great scientist too. Um, and your mission is worth about uh, 10 times or more than, than mine is. <laughs> um, I also wanna uh, thank Kim uh, for the invitation to, to, to present uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, it's always enjoyable to do that. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, what, what I've, I've sort of tweaked the content a little bit. Um, I am going to talk about Osiris Rex and uh, some of the interesting things that we've done there. And I'll, I'll sort of have a CU take on it because there are a lot of CU grads involved with that mission. Um, but I also want to give a little background, uh, just in case you're not familiar with asteroids, and cover some of the history and then look a little bit to the future as well. Uh, in terms of what's going to be coming up uh, in the next uh, a few years, uh, literally what, what's happening right now. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, so let's let's take it out, take it away, uh, and talk about exploration missions to asteroids. It's something that I've been doing um, uh, since, really, since I got my PhD. And sometime I'll tell you the story about how I randomly got involved with this field and, and how it's really shaped everything I've done. Um, but the first fundamental question, which was one of the questions I had when I first got my PhD and started working on this area, is what are asteroids? Now, one thing is clear, uh, you, you see that they're very uh, interesting looking bodies. Uh, the orbits around them can have great regularity and great randomness. Uh, they, they come in pairs and all that. But uh, uh, you, you know, how should we think of them scientifically? And uh, really the simplest definition, and there are many, are that they are small solar system bodies that orbit the sun. Sometimes they hit the earth as well. And this is uh, a, 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 cam, uh, a car cam of the Chelyabinsk uh, um, uh, asteroid as it entered the earth's atmosphere. Uh, the largest one is Ceres, which is actually not an asteroid anymore. It's now a dwarf planet, uh, about a thousand kilometers across. And the smallest, well, you, you know, you, you could technically even call us a small grain of sand an asteroid, although we our terminology tends to diverge as we get very small. Really, it's a diverse collection of bodies with differing compositions, physical morphology, history, and locations. So here's a snapshot of the solar system. Uh, with, with all known uh, or really numbered asteroids taken at a certain time. All the little Vs are, um, uh, are, are comets, I believe. And here we definitely see that there's this huge concentration in what we call the main belt. Um, you can see this, these two little clumps here, the Trojan asteroids. You should ask Hal about them. Um, and we see that there are a few asteroids that appear to be in the inner solar system but if instead of showing where they are at a certain instant, if we actually show where their orbits are, we actually see that there is also a great concentration of asteroids whose orbits pass through the inner solar system. Uh, so that uh, they're, they're not only interesting bodies being in the solar system, but they're interesting bodies because they come very close to us, which have certain benefits um, and, and perils as well. I always think it's helpful to give some visual um, uh, uh, cues as to the sizes of asteroids, just because the, these bodies that we're interested in, they scale orders of magnitude in size. And especially when you get to exploration, how you explore these different size bodies actually changes a lot. And I'm not gonna talk about that uh, uh, today, but that's, that's an interesting fact about asteroids. So here's the largest 
asteroid, now a dwarf planet series compared to the moon and the earth. Um, and then these are the four largest asteroids, two of which are now called uh, dwarf planets. And, and you see their size relative to Ceres. Um, so if you take Vesta, which is this one, and then you start plotting additional asteroids that we visited uh, 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 from Lutetia all the way down to Itakawa, which you can't actually can't even see. It's less than a pixel uh, in, 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 in this uh, a graphic. But if we then focus on Lutetia and, and then rescale again, and here's Lutetia, and here's a variety of other asteroids that we have visited, and now, if your eyes are good, you can see that Itakawa shows up as a little speck. Um, and we've explored things from Itakawa to Eros being in orbit. And with flybys, we've actually, and, and up to the Vesta and Ceres, and with flybys, we've actually explored um, all of these different bodies. Um, so that's sort of a, a sweep through the size scale of these asteroids. Um, and sure, they're, they're interesting. They, they span orders of magnitude and size, but fundamentally, why should we be interested? Why are we interested as scientists, as society, as, as, uh, uh, as what have you? Um, and really, the, the driving thing is science and nature, too, because if you, if you visit an asteroid, you can be on the cover. Uh, and that's a great motivation for a scientist, right? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, of course, it also is the scientific study of these bodies that we're interested in. And just at a very high level, we know that asteroids are essentially remnants of the early solar system. And they date in one form or another, even if they've been processed again and again, all the way back to the solar system's formation. Um, they've, they also act as tracer particles that record how the major planets have moved over time. Um, they've shaped life on Earth by delivering water and minerals to the early Earth, and also by causing occasional impact extinctions. Um, uh, from a physics perspective, they're really a unique form of matter. Uh, when you get these small asteroids, especially that may be spinning fast, uh, there's this balance of gravity inertial forces and molecular van der Waals forces that are all on an equal footing holding these, these assemblages together. And to study and understand them uh, is, is really a big goal that I have. Um, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But by understanding that state of matter, it gets new insights on planetary rings, protoplanetary disks, and, and other extreme forms of matter. So that's a motivation. Exploration is a motivation. Uh, Near-Earth asteroids are a natural destination for, for future human exploration missions. They've been considered uh, many times in the past. Uh, they're the most easily accessible bodies outside the Earth-Moon system. Sometimes they're even easier to access in some ways than the Moon. And NASA has, at a number of different times, seriously considered sending humans to them for exploration. So this is a, a, a recurring theme again and again. Um, asteroids are great for exploration, for thinking about the future. Tied up with that are the resources that asteroids have. Uh, there's a relatively large community of people that are very focused on this. Um, and in fact, some NASA missions, which, which were not completed to uh, fruition, were actually fundamentally focused on this resource question. And there are, in fact, companies that have been launched uh, who are focused on uh, going to asteroids and mining them, even though it sounds so far out. Now, and this is a, this is a very cool graphic. Uh, they're sort of making the point that the most valuable thing out there is water on these primitive bodies. Uh, now, the note of caution, the, the company that made this actually went bankrupt a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's still a very difficult uh, endeavor. There are still some companies that are trying to think about how to do this, but literally it's, it's, it's probably decades in the future, but it is a motivation for why we wanna understand asteroids. Maybe the most fundamental reason though, over a longer time span is uh, from a societal perspective. 
Uh, we know that small bodies continually impact the Earth. The shooting stars, the Chelyabinsk uh, that I showed you earlier, we know that they've caused large-scale extinctions in the past. Just think about the dinosaurs, uh, if not several other um, uh, cataclysmic uh, uh, events that we've seen in the record. And it's a, it's a, it's a simple question, um, and it's a real question. If we detect an asteroid and we see that it's on a collision course, is there actually anything that we could do? Could we stop it? Could we deflect it? And this is actually a, a, a pretty serious area of study. In fact, every couple of years, there's a international conference, the Planetary Defense Conference, that pulls together scientists, engineers, media specialists, politicians, policy people, in order to just discuss and debate uh, what's the appropriate thing to do if there, in fact, were an asteroid discovered that had a high probability of impacting the Earth. It hasn't happened yet. It may not happen for a long time, um, but we know it's happened in the past. And, and from a, from a long-term point of view, this is something that society will deal with at some point in the future. So that's sort of a quick intro to asteroids, why we're interested in them and, and what motivates some of the work that we do. Um, it's, it's, it's also appropriate to then talk about, well, which asteroids have we explored and, and not just discovered from ground-based telescopes, but actually got close to and taken in situ measurements, whether from a flyby or from stopping and orbiting or actually from landing on the surface. And here's a nice graphic. Um, I still think it's complete. Pretty soon we'll have to add a few more uh, uh, asteroids on here. Uh, sort of showing all the different asteroids that have been visited um, uh, uh, with the initial one really being um, uh, Gaspra uh, with a Galileo flyby of that body. Um, and we're going to focus in on just a couple of them here. The, some of the ones that have gone to the smaller bodies have stopped. And, and also we'll talk about some flyby missions and, and the importance that those have. Um, and Really, there are two different ways that we explore asteroids fundamentally. The one, which is in some ways the simplest, is just by flying by them with the spacecraft and taking observations. And it's sort of like if you want to visit New York City, one way of doing that is just to drive through the freeways with a camera and just take a bunch of pictures as you go through. Um, and uh, you learn a lot. It's not the same thing as stopping and getting out of the car. But especially in the early stages of exploration, this really opened our eyes as to the shape, the size, the properties uh, of these small bodies. And these are some examples of different flyby missions that have, that have occurred. Now, especially the early flybys, such as this one here, uh, which is pretty recent. This was done by the Chinese of the asteroid Teutatis. What you would tend to do, it's, it's not just that you're driving through the city taking pictures, but you, you, your camera is pointing one direction. And as you drive, you just keep on snapping in that direction. You don't turn around and track anything. And I'll talk a little bit later um, about some upcoming missions where we actually have much more agile spacecraft so that these flybys can actually provide us a lot more information. So I'll, I'll come back to that later. The other way we explore asteroids is by going up, you know, flying our spacecraft to them and then stopping and uh, essentially breaking and, and, and essentially going into orbit around these bodies. The first body that we've done this with was the um, a NEAR mission. Uh, this was to asteroid Eros. Uh, we launched in this uh, 1990, oh, this is wrong. 1996, and we landed on Eros in 2000. Sorry about that, or 2001, actually. And this was really the first time we got close to and did a comprehensive mapping of an asteroid. Um, this is just a little GIF movie, uh, a bunch of images that were taken of it uh, during the mission. This is just a great uh, perspective showing the body. Um, and at the end of the mission, we actually landed the spacecraft on the surface of the asteroid. Obviously, this is an artist's rendition. And we actually tracked the, the spacecraft on the surface for a couple of weeks. Um, and that was after a full year of being in orbit around this body. So uh, uh, this was a, a really the, the, the first 
rendezvous mission, it was uh, extremely important and it sort of laid the groundwork for a lot of the future missions that we're doing. Um, now, just for a size comparison, here's a little graphic of the Empire State Building, and then you see Eros uh, put beside it. So, you know, roughly order of Manhattan size, maybe larger. Uh, and you see interesting things like huge boulders on the surface. These things have to be as big as, you know, some of our campus buildings uh, uh, for sure, just lying around on the surface. So after near uh, in Eros, the next important asteroid that we visited, uh, the next mission was actually by the Japanese Space Agency. And this was the Hayabusa mission and it visited the asteroid Itakawa, which is shown here. And this gives you a scale. You saw how big the, the Empire State Building was compared to Eros. And we see that, yeah, Itakawa was just a couple big boulders on the surface of that asteroid. Yet it's an asteroid in and of itself. It has its own geophysics. It has its own history and evolution and all of that. This was an important mission because it was the first sample return missions to an asteroid. This is one of the samples that was brought back. This was uh, about one of the largest ones, about 100 microns across. And literally they only got a few micrograms uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, which I can explain. Um, this is the spacecraft returning to the Earth uh, and, and the um, capsule uh, coming in, landing in Australia back in 2010. Again, an artist rendition of, of, of that sampling event um, uh, for that mission. Uh, so this was 2003, arrived in 2005 at Itakawa, and it got back to Earth in 2010. Actually, three years late. And if you know anything about space mechanics, you realize that once you're in space, uh, if you miss your return date, it's pretty hard to get back later. Uh, so, so it was a very exciting, very interesting mission. So um, we have had recently a couple of more uh, uh, missions to explore these small asteroids. And here we're mostly talking about near Earth asteroids because they are the simplest ones for us to get to with spacecraft. Um, one that uh, the, whose mission was really just completed uh, was the Hayabusa 2 mission. Uh, this was a, a sort of a copy of the Hayabusa spacecraft. This is a little bit different, some improvements. It launched um, in 2014. It got to its target, Ryugu, uh, uh, in 2018, a slightly larger asteroid than Itakawa. It, uh, I'll show you some images about what it did um, and then just, just brought its sample back to the Earth uh, last year, last December. This is probably the most exciting mission that you'll find. Uh, actually, more exciting than OSIRIS-REx. Um, first off is just the mode in which they orbit around this asteroid. They actually don't go into orbit. They use the fact that it's a relatively small body. It's about a kilometer across. Um, so its gravity is very weak. And they use that fact to actually hover in space above the surface of the asteroid, between the asteroid and the sun. And they zoom in in order to measure the gravity field to get high resolution images. And they zoom out and they do this again and again. And by, by, by carrying out these operations over several months, maybe almost a year, they were able to map the surface, determine where they could do a landing and then with one of these uh, approaches to the surface, we're actually able to come down, touch the surface, ca capture their sample, and then blast off and go away. And this is sort of an interesting movie on the, on the right. Um, you can see here, this is actually reflection of the spacecraft of the surface. This is the sample horn of the spacecraft. And here you see it comes down, when it comes down, there's not much going on. It touches and then it uses it as a exhaust engines to push away from the asteroid. And that really lifts up all of these rocks in a, in a huge uh, a hailstorm, if you will, around the surface. Um, and then as it's rising up, you can see here the shadow of the uh, spacecraft as it, get far, as it gets farther and farther away. After these touchdowns on the surface, both Hayabusa 2 and OSIRIS-REx, they had a huge degradation in their optics, meaning there was just a lot of very fine dust that we didn't even see that ended up 
sticking to the uh, visible optics of these uh, spacecraft. Um, another thing the Hayabusa 2 mission did is it deployed uh, several rovers on the surface. Um, here on the left is, a, is an image of one of those rovers resting on the surface, and here is a, a time lapse of a, of a day on the asteroid surface, just taking pictures as, this, as the asteroid is rotating in space, making the, the, the sun rise and set. Uh, the Europeans had a very capable rover, the mascot rover, that was also deployed to the surface. This just shows you the trajectory. This is the ballistic drop from the spacecraft. And then it hit the surface, and it actually bounced around for quite a while before it settled down. And they were able to take uh, 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 some very detailed measurements of the surface, uh, uh, very interesting, really unprecedented. Okay, so that's, that's a lot. <laughs> the next thing that the Japanese did was they actually had this little, uh, sort of like a bazooka on board and they detached this bazooka from the spacecraft. It, it sort of drifted over, uh, pointed down to the asteroid surface. The spacecraft went around, hid behind the asteroid, but they had this little camera that they launched as well and they blew a hole in the surface of the asteroid. They, they did a controlled cratering experiment. And these are reconstructed images uh, taken from this tiny little camera that they left behind uh, uh, in order to look at this. After a day or so, after they thought all the debris had settled down, then they went back and they took more detailed images of the surface as well. And here you see the before and the after of that crater events. Uh, 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 and, and, and you see that they moved uh, rocks around. They made a, a, a crater that was actually a bit larger than they expected. Um, so that was, that was quite exciting. And then they actually went and sampled not inside of that crater, but right next to the crater. So that they're actually getting uh, documented materials from the subsurface of this asteroid. Uh, they were able to calculate where that ejecta plume went, and uh, then they went down and they sampled for a second time on the surface, sort of similar scenario. You touch down, and then as you blast off, you get this hailstorm of rocks. And so they have a, a sampling from two sites on this asteroid. Um, so then they finally called it quits, uh, and they came back to Earth, uh, they had a reentry over Australia again, uh, uh, got, the, got the sample canister, brought it into the lab, and popped it open. And now these samples are actually, um, have been distributed around the world. I know that NASA has some at Johnson, and I'm sure there's, there's some in, in, in Europe as well, and, and of course a lot in uh, Japan as well. And they're starting to analyze these, and I think papers are just starting to come out about uh, what they're finding in terms of the properties of this. Uh, uh, it's really a, a very a primitive carbonaceous asteroid. So that's Hayabusa 2. Um, and that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's, it's sort of hard to follow that show. Um, but the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is the NASA mission uh, 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 that also is going to a relatively similar body uh, sampling the surface and, uh, in fact, uh, had, has had great success and is now coming back to the Earth and it returns in September of 2023. So let's talk a little bit about this now. Um, first of all, it's, it's run out of the University of Arizona. Uh, Dante Loretta is a PI. Um, the, the original PI was Mike Drake, but he unfortunately passed away uh, early in the mission. And, and Dante stepped up and, and very amply and capably uh, filled his shoes. Um, so OSIRIS-REx is a NASA mission, which means uh, <laughs> there are, of course, exceptions like Lucy and Janice, but its name is an acronym. And if you study uh, all, what all these words mean in the acronym of OSIRIS-REx, you actually get a pretty good feel for what the scientific goals of this mission are. Really, by getting the sample, a uh, pristine sample uh, from a very primitive carbonaceous asteroid, and we get that into the lab, we'll be able to uh, probe the, really the origins of, um, of the material that, that we believe led to life on Earth. 
Um, there's a lot of other interesting aspects, uh, uh, sort of how to get ground truth for ground-based observations, resource identification. This goes back to that resource uh, motivation that I mentioned before. It is in fact driving uh, some of the Cyrus Rex science. Uh, security, this is planetary defense. This is what's the probability of Bennu hitting the earth. Um, and then finally to really explore what the surfaces of these bodies are like. Uh, and, and our exploration of Bennu showed us uh, a huge number of, of interesting surprises and uh, completely new insights, unexpected insights into these bodies. So again, for scale, here's Bennu, Empire State Building, uh, Eiffel Tower. Uh, Ryugu, I don't have a scale of this, but Ryugu is about twice as big. Uh, it's, it's, this one's 500 meters in diameter. Ryugu was about a kilometer in diameter. One of the interesting things is that uh, Bennu has been characterized as one of the most potentially hazardous asteroids that we know of. Um, and of course, it's not hazardous now, but in about 150 years, it, its orbit evolves so that there is a probability of it impacting on the Earth. Uh, and the revised impact numbers, um, which actually went up just a little bit based on our best final information from the whole OSIRIS-REx rendezvous phase at this asteroid, is one in 2700 in 2182. Um, and so, so this is not a negligible risk, but it's quite far out in the future. And it's something that will be looked at and monitored and, and understood as time goes on. So what did we actually do at, at Bennu with the OSIRIS-REx mission? Uh, so this is a rough outline of its itinerary. Uh, we arrived in late 2008. And we carried out some reconnaissance flybys of the asteroid, and we mapped the surface in detail, constructed shape models of it. From the flybys, we were able to weigh the asteroid and actually measure its total mass. With the shape, we're then able to get its, its, its density, uh, which is, a, you know, of course, a, a, a key property of, of, of materials. Um, at some point, we actually entered into orbit around it. And this is a very peculiar orbit. Um, if you notice, it's, it's, we're, we're actually looking from the sun to the asteroid. And you see that we're following the asteroid as it orbits around the solar system. And the orbit, without any propulsion at all, is actually following the sun. It's what we call a sun terminator orbit. And it's, if you're familiar with sun synchronous orbits at the Earth, in some ways, it's similar to that, but sun synchronous orbits actually use the oblateness of the Earth in order to, to, to get that orbit precession. Here is actually the solar radiation pressure, just the light, the photons bouncing off the spacecraft that actually torque the orbit and force it to follow the sun. Um, and you have to be in a very specific type of orbit. If you deviate too far from this orbit, then these photons will actually make you impact on the surface of the asteroid. So this is one of the interesting ways that we explored it. Completely different approach than what the uh, Japanese did with the Hayabusa and the Hayabusa 2 missions, which is another interesting thing, that there are multiple ways to actually explore uh, this, the, these small bodies, these asteroids with spacecraft. So after being in orbit for quite a while, um, uh, we, we chose a touch and go site, and then we carried out this tag surface sampling. I'll show you some pictures in a bit in 2020. And now we've left the asteroid and we're heading back to earth in 2023. All the spacecraft operations for this mission were actually just down the road uh, at Lockheed uh, Martin Waterton campus, uh, just on the south side of Denver, southwest side of Denver. The science operations were all at the University of Arizona. Here's a sort of a, a global picture, really a mosaic of Bennu. And uh, it looks pretty featureless, although you notice that there's not, there are some craters that it's not dominated by craters. Like if you looked at the moon uh, at this size scale, and there seem to be a lot of rocks. And actually the closer you get to it, and the more you zoom, zoom in, what we find is that the whole surface is completely tiled with rocks. 
And in fact, we we were expecting there to be maybe a, a, a 20, 30 meter radius of sort of smooth, flat area where we could safely land the spacecraft. Once we got there, we realized that no such area existed. And the best we could do is maybe a five to 10 meter region where things were not so rocky where we could actually touch down. Same thing happened to the Hayabusa 2 mission. So both missions had to completely redesign their concept of operations for coming down to the surface to carry out that sampling. Uh, and, and it was it was really quite a feat to see the, the, the two different space agencies, two different spacecraft teams, how they solved that problem. Again, using very different approaches. However, they both came up with successful solutions. Uh, this boulder is kind of cool because it sort of looks, if you cross your eyes, it looks like a buffalo, right? <laughs> um, and this is just an interesting example. I could show, you know, hundreds of pictures. Um, this little sequence is interesting because it sort of gives you the scale from surface down to uh, uh, or, or uh, for, from a global view down to the surface, just showing some one particular interesting area of the of of the asteroid, and uh, uh, with the colors and all that, you can sort of uh, uh, see how the surface properties, how the morphology of the surface changes as you go from a global view down to this close in view, and you also get a size scale just by uh, uh, these fields of view. So one of the really striking things that happened that we discovered at um, Bennu was that there were these showers of particles being expelled from its surface, uh, sort of centimeter scale particles, you know, smaller and not more than a couple centimeters at best. And occasionally uh, we would see all these little stars. Originally, they thought that they were stars, but they couldn't match them to any star catalog. And then they realized that, you know, from a sequence of imaging, that these were little particles being ejected from the surface of the asteroid. This is a phenomena that was completely unexpected. There are a couple hypotheses as to what's going on here, and it's, it's still an active area of study. The simpler one is that these are just micrometeorite impacts that happen once in a while, and something hits, and then it blows up a bunch of uh, particles. These particles, most of them actually fall back down onto the surface of the asteroid. And we'll see one implication of that in a little bit. Other ones actually escape, fly away. Some of them actually get trapped into orbit for some period of time before they re-impact or escape. And that actually opened up what, what um, my team on the OSIRIS-REx mission was supposed to do which was uh, uh, called radio science. And we were supposed to measure the gravity field of the asteroid. Now, typically, uh, so, so the, the, the radio science team was really at CU in the, in the aerospace engineering department. It was myself, uh, Professor McMahon, um, and, and a number of GSRAs over the year. Typically, when you say radio science for an asteroid mission, what you're really talking about is using Doppler tracking in order to measure the accelerations acting on the spacecraft. And by processing this with detailed models of the body and all that, you essentially weigh the asteroid by orbiting around it for quite some time. So what we were able to determine is that Bennu is very porous. It's about 40% porous. Uh, if we get higher order gravity field coefficients, we can actually track how that void space is distributed inside of the body. Um, and then that gives us immediate information such as surface gravity. And here we see it's really uh, um, uh, uh, micro G's, uh, if you will. And, um, and it gives us better insight into explaining the bulge, what, what Hal had, had, had mentioned earlier on and all that. However, for OSIRIS-REx, one of the huge benefits of those particles being ejected was that by tracking those ejected particles, that actually provided a much more precise gravity field than what we could get from the orbiting spacecraft. And that work was largely done at, at JPL when we had some JPL team members involved as well, uh, along with graduate students from the University of Colorado who, who were at CU at the time, um, uh, tracking all of these particles and using 
their orbits in order to estimate the gravity field of Bennu. And what we were able to do was to actually measure the gravity field of, of Bennu. And this is sort of an abstract spot, uh, plot showing gravity field uh, magnitude as a, a, as a function of degree. The important lines here, this green line is the uncertainty in the gravity field that we got by tracking the particles. And this yellowish line up here is the uncertainty in the gravity field that we had by tracking the spacecraft. So you see that the, uh, the, by tracking particles, we had much better information about the gravity field than we would have gotten just using the spacecraft alone. This is because the particles are launched from the surface. They come extremely close to the surface. So they're really sensing the mass distribution of the body. Um, and one of the more important things that we do is we actually difference the measured gravity field from a constant density model of the gravity field. And that actually gives us insight into the uh, mass distribution within the asteroid, or if you will, the void distribution, since it's, since it's such a porous body. That was one of the key things that we did on the OSIRIS-REx mission on the radio science team. And that allows us to come up with these things called uh, bourgeois maps, which are really measuring the signal of the density inhomogeneities. And here, this is sort of a novel one where it's actually evaluated over the surface of the asteroid. And you can then measure uh, uh, the range of variation just due to uh, non-constant density. So this right off the bat tells us that there is significant density in homogeneity within the body. This is that same map plot, plotted on the surface of Bennu. Um, and here you got a, a, a percent variation in the accelerations uh, 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 on the order of up to 3%. We're also able to do a lot of other analysis of the uh, situation. Uh, we're, uh, this uh, plot is what we're calling the rotational Roche lobe of the body. The yellow is the actual asteroid surface. And this red is really just this energetic surface around the body. Um, and if you have an energy less than the energy of this red surface, and if you're inside of it, you're actually trapped to the surface of the body. So something like Bennu that's um, relatively rapidly spinning, a spin period of uh, four and a quarter hours, very low gravity, this distended shape, it turns out that the lowest point in the gravity field is actually at the equator, not at the poles, which is what you usually expect for a mass distribution. So a lot of what we did on the radio science team is just analyzing the energetics of motion, understanding um, uh, uh, where things would be expected to be found. And this tells us that we would sort of expect material to slide down the slopes of the asteroid and get trapped inside of this rotational Roche lobe of the body. And in fact, we find clear evidence for that. Uh, this is a map of the slope of the surface of the body. And this includes the gravity and the rotational dynamics of Bennu. And this black line is where that energetic surface, the rotational Roche lobe intersects the surface. And what we see is that the higher and lower latitudes, we have much higher slopes. And it seems as if material is actually being fed into and trapped inside of this rotational Roche lobe. And here, if we uh, uh, average the slopes, we see that clearly there's a low slope region inside of that lobe, high slope regions, higher slope regions outside of it. And we also note that the shape of the asteroid is also distended uh, right where that Roche lobe starts. So this makes us think potentially that this uh, equatorial bulge uh, could be formed of accumulated bodies maybe these small particles being launched up in orbit and then gently falling back down to the surface. Uh, I say gently because the, the, the uh, impact speeds will be on the order of a few centimeters per second, which, you know, if, if, if you drop something from a millimeter or so, it lands at a centimeter per second. So very gentle dynamics going on uh, at these bodies.
And in fact, by analyzing the gravity field, we're able to put some constraints on the mass distribution. Uh, and, and what we find is it's consistent with the core of the asteroid being under dense. We don't know how under dense there is. There is a fundamental ambiguity here. And uh, for there being some under denseness at the equator as well, we're actually able to test that out uh, uh, with other more sophisticated models uh, where we see that this equatorial ridge has a lower density, the middle layer has a higher density, and then th at, the, at the core of it, there's actually a deficit of mass. Um, although, of course, this being mass distribution, there are many other deviations that can also fit with the gravity field. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, we, we are relatively confident of the interpretation that the center is under dense, which is what's shown here with the, um, with the starred uh, uh, possible different distribution models. So that's some of what we did on the mission um, at CU. Uh, there's so much more done. There's, there's literally hundreds of papers, several hundreds of papers that have been written already and many more to go. Um, most importantly though, uh, OSIRIS-REx was a sample return mission, is a sample return mission. So eventually uh, they had to come down and actually sample the surface. So this movie on the left sort of is the, um, uh, uh, our version of that sampling movie comes down, orients. Uh, it actually penetrated the surface by almost half a meter or more and felt almost no acceleration as it was pushing down. And then they released the gas to capture the material. They captured it with nitrogen gas and they blew the thrusters to back away. And that really is what causes all of this mess. Again, this, this drastic hill storm uh, uh, after that surface sampling. So unlike Hayabusa 2, um, we were content with one run to the surface. Um, and after we captured, uh, uh, you know, went through this whole procedure, we then were able to take images of the sample canister when we were back in orbit. And it was so packed with material that, that really there were small particles that were actually escaping out of the sample head container. Um, so the decision was made that, yeah, we, we have what we need. We have uh, a, a nice uh, uh, um, amount, may, maybe a kilogram, a couple of kilograms of, uh, of sample. So then they take the sample head, they stow it in the sample return canister, and then they seal that canister and they latch it shut. And once that happens, we can't do any more sampling and the spacecraft um, essentially started to drift away from Bennu. And then I think it was earlier this year, it actually uh, started on its return trajectory to the Earth, which again takes a, 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 another couple of years, really. So I think it's interesting to point out, since this is the uh, uh, CU uh, 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 retired faculty uh, organization, that there are a lot of uh, CU alums in leadership roles and in all sorts of operations for the, uh, uh, for the spacecraft. Um, as you go through the list, there are many of the, the leaderships, especially on the flight dynamics uh, team uh, that, that, that led different aspects. Um, Professor McMahon from, from my department was deputy lead on the radio science team. Uh, Mike Moreau uh, is a PhD uh, uh, from, from our department, uh, Pete Intrigian from our department, uh, Bo Beerhouse from our department. He actually did a lot of work with SWERI and he was getting his PhD as well. Uh, Yu Takahashi at JPL was also integrally involved. And this is a sampling of, of um, not even all of the CU alums that were involved on the spacecraft flight dynamics team and navigation team. Uh, which was at Lockheed Martin, Goddard Space Center, Kinetics, and, and other, um, uh, other organizations as well. So I think that's a sort of kind of neat to, to point out. So, um, so that's what we've done. Uh, where are we going to go in the future? What are we going to do next? And there's actually a lot going on here. Um, first and foremost, just launched, uh, just what was it, a, like a, not even a month ago, is the Lucy mission. 
Hal Levison, uh, who graciously introduced me, is the PI of Lucy. And uh, uh, I think he could do a much better job talking about it uh, than I could. Uh, and uh, yeah, it would probably be great to have him come by and, 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 and give a talk for you guys. Um, but Lucy uh, uh, is doing these uh, a series of flybys of the Trojan asteroids. Um, and the Trojans are thought to be captured asteroids from much earlier in the solar system. And I, 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 I can't do the whole scenario justice, but by flying by and imaging and taking measurements of these asteroids, uh, Lucy will be able to get great insight into the early conditions in the solar system. Now, these, these are flybys, and I was sort of disparaging flybys before, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about flybys in a, in, in a couple of slides, and in, in that the way we're doing them now and envisioning them now, they become much more um, uh, 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 scientifically rich, if you will. Another mission that's going to launch um, this month, uh, it could launch this month or all the way into February, we're hoping it'll launch this month, is NASA's DART mission. And this is actually a, a planetary defense mission. The main goal of this mission is actually to impact the secondary of a binary asteroid because we'll be able to detect the change in orbit of the secondary as it orbits its primary. And from that, be able to get better insight into the really the momentum coupling between an impactor and the surface of an asteroid. Now, there are scientific interests, there is scientific interest in understanding this sort of coupling, but there's also planetary defense interest here because uh, if you hit an asteroid, it, it's not like a cue ball where you, you bring in the momentum and you just transfer that momentum to the next ball. Um, essentially, by impacting and excavating a crater, everything in that ejected field that escapes actually contributes to the momentum that you give to this body. And that factor uh, uh, can be a, a factor of, of one, two, or three times how much momentum you bring into it just with your impact. And understanding that coupling is actually very important when it comes to understanding you know, how large of an asteroid we could deflect with a very simple technique such as this, this impactor technique. So that's one of the motivators for the DART mission. It's actually gonna be followed up by a European mission uh, called HERA, which will launch in a few years and then come and orbit around this binary asteroid and uh, take images and, and sort of see, uh, get, get additional details about that, uh, uh, the, the, the crater on, on, the, on that binary asteroid. I have a cool movie, but I don't think I'm gonna show it uh, just to keep things in, in time. Then a year from now, um, uh, the Psyche mission launches uh, in August of 2022, and it gets to Psyche in 2026. This one has been in the papers a lot because this is thought to be a big met metallic core, really a remnant of a protoplanetary uh, uh, core from earlier in the history of the solar system. This is the one that they calculate, you know, what's the dollar value of this asteroid if you brought it back to Earth, which is sort of a foolish thing to do, I suppose, but, um, uh, uh, but, but it, it certainly played into a lot of headlines. So this is a very exciting mission. Um, and, and for me personally, it's extremely exciting, even though I'm not involved with Psyche at all, um, because uh, the mission that I'm the PI of, uh, Janus, uh, we will have a ride share on the Psyche mission. So when Psyche launches in August of 2022, uh, we'll have two of our little spacecraft uh, uh, on that same launch vehicle. Our spacecraft will go off, each one will fly by a different binary asteroid and take uh, a, a, really a, a whole slew of images of these systems as we fly by them. So what's special about um, Janus is that this is a simplex mission, which is a much riskier class of mission. It's what we call a class D mission, which really allows us to drive the cost down a lot. 
So our mission is about 5% of the total cost of something like Lucy or Psyche. Um, we're uh, about 50 million. Those uh, missions, when you add on the whole extended mission phase and all that, easily get up to about a billion or so. Um, we're a joint uh, venture between Lockheed Martin, CU, and Malin Space Sciences. Um, and yeah, we don't have a NASA center involved, which is also pretty unique, uh, although we certainly have NASA oversight uh, on everything that we do. So the targets that we go to um, are two asteroids that have actually been very well observed, uh, 1991 VH and 1996 FG3. The science questions that we address are really, how do we describe these rubble pile asteroids? How do they vary over time? What properties do they have? Um, here's a couple of uh, uh, statistics on the size of the primaries, the size of the secondaries, and the size of the orbits. And you see that they're just a few kilometers across as a system. Even though they're sort of like mini Earth Moon systems, um, they have a very unique, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very small, uh, and, and yet they have all this rich geophysics going on. The science that we're really trying to understand is that we know that these small rubble pile asteroids, uh, when you get down below 10 kilometers, go through these very chaotic sequences where they can repeat these cycles again and again and again, what we call life cycles. But the two asteroids we're going to are on this key pathway where one of them is actually stuck in a very stable state and it's gonna sit in this state ad infinitum, essentially. It's in this equilibrium that balances tides and photon pressure and dynamics. Uh, and the other one is actually still in a chaotic state. It hasn't settled down yet. And um, uh, with our flybys, we'll fly by each one of these asteroids and be able to characterize them. There's other great benefits as well. There are different types of asteroids uh, and, and, and a lot of um, other interesting aspects of it that could go on uh, all day about it. Just to talk a little bit more about how we do the flyby and what makes these new flybys different is that um, as our spacecraft flies by the binary asteroid, we've actually designed the spacecraft so it can pivot and track that system throughout the flyby. So we actually get a full range of phase angles as you go through the body. The original flybys could only hold a certain aspect and maybe turn once to, to view the body as you come in and then as you go out. And in fact, when we're doing this, we're actually using technology that was developed for the Lucy uh, discovery mission uh, that HAL is leading. Um, and so we're actually leveraging the investment that was made in Lucy and bringing it to our own low cost satellites. Um, the full observation sequence that we have is then a few days out, we actually take photometry measurements of our binary asteroid. And this is really measuring the light fluctuations that allows us to nail down where in the orbit the secondary is very precisely. We do that, uh, couple days before, a couple days after. As we fly by, and we're flying by here at about four kilometers per second, we actually rotate the spacecraft and we take visible images. And this is roughly the sort of pixel scale we'll have on the surface, the level of detail we'll get for the primary. And we get thermal IR observations throughout this uh, flyby where we're actually able to get information about how the temperature is distributed on these bodies that gives us huge insight into um, the properties of the bodies and on the forces acting on each of these bodies that will address the science questions that we have. Our science team uh, has several CU people involved again. Um, I saw one of the um, uh, uh, main contributors, uh, Kaya Sorley, was on uh, earlier at least, and she's on this uh, thermal IR observation team. She's working out of LASP. And then here's a sort of a graphic of what it will look like as we track the asteroid through its closest approach. Uh, the flyby is fast enough so that we won't see the secondary move uh, in, the, in the minutes that we have these uh, high resolution images, but we'll be able to time the images so that we also can get interesting aspects such as the 
secondary casting a shadow on the primary, which will also give us great uh, additional insight into the thermal properties uh, and the thermal inertia of the asteroid surface. Okay, so that's what's coming up in the short term. What does the future hold? I just got a couple of slides on this. First of all, there's a lot of work just going on in technology development for asteroid exploration. Uh, a lot of work going on at CU, a lot of work going on at many other universities and engineering um, uh, uh, departments as well. And this is very exciting. We have a lot of PhD students that have made contributions in these areas. Um, and it's something that I love working on. Um, way out in the future, maybe an ultimate challenge uh, uh, is, is this asteroid 1950 DA. It, its orbit is very well known. And we can predict that in, uh, man, you know, 800, 900 years, it has a pretty high probability of impact. This is actually much larger than Bennu. Uh, and the impact of an asteroid this size would be catastrophic for, for the planet, I, I, I believe, or, or getting close to there. This body is also interesting. It's spinning so fast that it has to have some cohesive force, which we think are just weak molecular van der Waals forces holding it together. So that in fact, if you hit it with that dart approach, the whole asteroid might just explode, fall apart and uh, uh, recoagulate again, potentially. So this is a great motivator for the future. And in fact, there are a lot of very innovative ideas about how we would actually pull something like this out of the way. This idea is the gravity tractor where you're just using gravitational attraction between a massive spacecraft and an asteroid, sort of like a tractor beam from Star Trek to slowly pull on an asteroid. And then over time, you can actually move it enough so that it will miss the earth. This is just another idea, a, another fascinating approach to, to dealing with this ultimate problem for small bodies in how they interact with the earth. Okay, so with that, thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to, to, to answer any questions you may have. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to show up here and talk. Uh, I suppose it'd be more fun to be in person, but hey, this, <laughs> I'll take this. So thanks a lot. I see that there's one question in the chat. So uh, what are the predictions that any asteroids will affect the Earth or any of our sun's planets? Well, they, they do affect the, these bodies by impacting on them occasionally. Although the impacts, you know, from a planetary perspective, uh, e even if it causes, you know, a big crater and all that are, are relatively minimal. I think the greatest example of this is the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet which, um, man, that was, uh, that was quite some time ago. I was just out of uh, grad school. Right before. And yeah, yeah, and that got ripped apart by uh, a close approach to Jupiter. And then it, all these pieces plummeted into Jupiter and you saw these, these fascinating um, uh, uh, sort of impact plumes and all these effects. And, but you know, ultimately Jupiter just swallowed it up and Jupiter is still Jupiter. Uh, uh, so, so these things have effects. If you really dig into it, and there's something called the Nice model that Hal has actually done a lot of work on, uh, it turns out that just by flying by these small asteroids, you can actually migrate planets over time that can cause huge variations in, in the solar system. In fact, may have played a key, key role in, in setting up the solar system as we know it now. Um, next question is what elements were identified in the return samples? So um, that, that goes a little bit out of my field of expertise, so I can't just run it off the top of my head. I know the Hayabusa samples from Itakawa have been completely analyzed. They've just started analyzing the samples from Rugu from the Hayabusa 2 mission. And I, I, I don't know if there's any definitive results on that yet, although Hal may, may have some idea. It's not my expertise either. I, um, what I can say is that these rocks, and we do have samples of them 
on Earth in the form of meteorites tend to have chemistries that are very different from the Earth in the sense that they look a lot like the sun minus, uh, minus the volatiles, and uh, which is why we call them primitive objects, right? There hasn't been a lot of chemistry from the original solar nebula from which they formed. Right. And, and in fact, the next question is, uh, what does analysis of the material tell us about the formation of the solar system and Earth? I, I think you touched on that, Hal. And I, 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 I think the interesting thing is if you, I, I've been told this, I, I think it's true. If you stand on the Earth, the dirt you're standing on has been cycled through to the center of the Earth how many times? You know, multiple times. All of the original information of that matter has been transformed. These small bodies, they've maybe gone through one cycle, maybe no cycles. So they are pristine. Um, when the solar system was condensing into these bodies, some of the bodies, especially when you go far, far enough out into the Kuiper belt and all that, have never really been processed. So they are really original samples of the protoplanetary disk. Um, yeah, if I can just add a little bit to that, right? The, the, the thing that um, you have to realize is that all the planets formed by the accretion of these little guys, right? And so there's sort of the dregs of planet formation is a way to think about them. Um, and so the small body populations that we see really were shaped uh, during these early times and haven't changed very much. So uh, a lot of my focus from a scientific point of view is ha ha trying to use these small body pop populations to tell us about the history of the solar system. Indeed, we named Lucy, Lucy, after the fossil Lucy, right? Uh, because of this connection that these small bodies can tell us about our origins. Thanks. Um, next question is from Sterling, age seven. Um, uh, do you think you will be able to nudge the asteroid away from the Earth? Well, I think we, as a, a, as a space community, as a society, definitely can nudge asteroids so that they don't impact the Earth. Um, again, there are several different ways of doing this um, that have been studied. The, 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 the biggest problem is the bigger the asteroid, sort of the 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 more you have to nudge it. Uh, it has more mass, it has more momentum, more, more momentum. You have to hit it harder, if you will, in order to nudge it out of the way. Um, if something gets too big, uh, one technology that people talk about using are, are nuclear explosions. But then that's that's a, a, a you know that's a difficult topic. Uh, to deal with because we also don't want um, people using this as an excuse to launch uh, nuclear weapons up into space. And so there's some controversy with that as well. But uh, yeah, there's been a variety of ways of nudging these asteroids out of the way that have been developed. And we're just now starting to test some of these technologies. I think there's one more question. How do the rocks in return samples compare with existing rocks on the earth. Um, I think Hal stated it well, uh, uh, that uh, it, at some level, the, the rocks in these samples were just the earliest types of rocks that came together to form these planetary bodies. Uh, and since then, they've been compressed, processed, chemically reacted, heated, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's still, you know, uh, the, the material uh, is, has not been destroyed. Uh, it's just only been transformed, if you will, over these billions of years. Okay, so that's the questions on the chat. I don't know if there's any other ones. Hal, do you want to give a status update on Lucy? Since it's actually flying in the solar it's system, it's actually flying. Uh, yeah, we launched uh, about a month ago. Uh, I've been told that it's one of the most beautiful launches they've done in a long time. It's just uh, the spacecraft flew through a cloud deck. Uh, I was busy; I didn't see it. But uh, if you're interested, go and look online. There's some 
great videos of the launch. Um, one of the first things that we had to do was deploy our solar arrays. Lucy is going further from the sun on solar panels than any other spacecraft in history. So we have these really massive solar arrays. Um, if you can see my background uh, over my shoulder, you can see those disc shape arrays. They're 7.3 meters in diameter. So uh, we, uh, one of them deployed fine. The other one almost completely deployed, but not quite. And so uh, right now our focus is how to get it um, completely deployed um, so we can uh, fly the mission. So we launched um, last October in an orbit that looks very similar to the Earth's. And then we are going to use encounter gravitational encounters with the Earth to pump up the orbit of the spacecraft to get out to the orbit of Jupiter um, to visit the Trojans. So um, we're going to fly by, our first flyby besides of the Earth is of a main belt asteroid called Donald Johansson. We named it after the discovery of the Lucy, uh, discoverer of the Lucy fossil. That's in 2025. And then we start encountering Trojans in 2027, um, ending in 2033. Uh, so we're going to go uh, by eight of these uh, eight asteroids, which again is another record. We're going past more asteroids than any other spacecraft in history. So that's where we are. Thanks. Oh, could, could I ask a question? I, I didn't get my question in the chat box. Uh, about how much water is there on Bennu? And and is it possible that the Earth's oceans could have been produced by asteroids such as Bennu? Yeah, that's that's a great question. It's it's one that I don't have much expertise in, but I, I, I can confidently say that that's one of the um, uh, 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 more important measurements that will be made with the Bennu samples once they come back to Earth. We, we do know that the um, that Bennu seems to be more a bit more water rich, uh, a bit more hydrated, I think the term is, than Rigu, the one that the Japanese samples come from, that that one seems to have been raised to a higher temperature in the past. And so it has driven off uh, 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 potentially more volatiles but one of the theories for the, um, you know, for those, those bursting particles on Bennu is in fact sort of thermal reactions uh, where you have heat waves going into the material and maybe there's some phase transition that happens that cause fracturing, thermal fracturing, uh, and then shoots up those sprays of particles. So once we get the samples in uh, in the laboratories, I, I think that's one of the one of the key measurements that they'll be taking, and we'll be looking to compare it and contrast it with uh, uh, the properties of of Earth's water. Is it, is it the asteroids that we would expect to provide water for the Earth, or or Kuiper Belt objects? I um, I think. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, we're not, we're not quite certain, right? One of the diagnostics is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Uh, so that'll be one of the things they're going to try to measure, uh, on, on, um, Bennu. The Bennu, actually, these objects, uh, based just on their type of objects and meteorites are roughly 10% water, so they're a lot. Right, that's compared to the Earth, which is you tend to think of it as a wet object, but it's actually a very dry object compared to what we see around the other rest of the solar system. So, if you take what we know about the DDH ratio, which could be highly biased, right, the most likely scenario is that asteroids did supply water to the Earth. The DDH ratio of comets, which come from the Kuiper Belt. Are are significantly different. That that's right, and and in fact, I, I think the the theories on this have changed over time. Yes. Uh, some time ago, people said, "Well, it comes from the comets," 
and and I guess that's been ruled out essentially. So, assuming right our measurements of the DDH ratio of comets is right, it's a very hard measurement. That's right. So, if there are no more questions, I I'd really like to thank you two guys, especially Dan, for your very lovely and detailed discussion of your work, and and Hal for your contributions. Um, My it's pleasure. Been, been a great evening in terms of introducing us to something that is really pretty fascinating, uh, close to, close to us on the Earth. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for the opportunity. We appreciate it. We do indeed. Thanks, Al. Bye yeah. bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Let, bye bye. Let, let me let me just say something about our next uh, talk is going to be on uh, December eighth uh, by Elizabeth Fenn, who is going to uh, who is in the history department and is going to uh, talk about Sacagawea's capture. Uh, she is writing. She's doing research on on Sacagawea and the and the culture associated with her um, on our web page. Uh, there's a picture of Elizabeth in uh, in Car Hinge, uh, and I particularly was amused by that. Um, Car Hinge is near Alliance, Nebraska, where where Sto it's the uh, it's the Nebraska form of Stonehenge using cars that are covered with gray paint. Um, and I, uh, as an astronomer, I was particularly amused to have uh, find evidence of astronomy even from our uh, excellent. Uh, historian Elizabeth Fenn. Um, so, so anyhow, we hope to see you uh, if you're interested on um, December 8th. And you can, of course, um, re request a uh, request uh, a entry to that uh, by uh, going on to our webpage. So thank you again for coming and uh, look forward to see you next month. <laughs>